Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. Welcome back to Fit for a Queen. We have Emily May on today. Emily is an international leader in the gender justice movement. In 2005, at the age of 24, she co-founded Hollaback in New York City, and in 2010, she became its first full-time executive director. Under her leadership, the organization has scaled to over 50 cities and 25 countries and launched HeartMob, Hollaback's platform designed to support people being harassed online, and the People's Supper, a collaboration designed to bring people together to repair the fissures in our relationships, heal, and bridge difference. Emmy believes that by having each other's backs in deep and meaningful ways, she can disrupt cycles of hate and create a world where everyone has the right to feel safe and confident. Prior to running Hollaback, Emily worked in the anti-poverty world as a case manager, political action coordinator, director of development, and most recently, a one-woman research and developmental team. She has worked on four political campaigns. Emily has a master's degree in social policy from the London School of Economics, is an Ashoka Fellow, a Prime Movers Fellow, and has won over 10 awards for her work, including the TED City 2.0 Prize. Emily, what a resume. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, This is such an important topic, and again, um, it it needs to be talked about. So can you first discuss and define what actually kind of street har- harassment is for our listeners and the extent of the issue on a national and what you guys are working on too, a global front? Yeah, absolutely. So we use street harassment to refer to sexual harassment that happens in public space, public masturbation, um, being followed, et cetera. So it really is a whole uh, spectrum of, uh, of behavior that we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And what about the extent of the issue for us locally and then, again, kind of on this international level that you guys are working on? Yeah, so we have uh, local leaders working in over 50 cities around the world. And, you know, what we've seen consistently is everywhere across the world, um, street harassment exists and it's a problem. And there are people there that are working to fight it and address it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, here uh, in in New York City, in Brooklyn, where we're located, um, street harassment certainly exists. It's certainly a problem, um, as it is, you know, everywhere else around the world. Um, it's hard to say exactly. Is it worse in Brooklyn? Is it wor- worse than, you know, um, Paris or Zimbabwe? Um, there really isn't concrete data that shows where it's worse. Mm-hmm. Um, what we uh, believe is just that because street harassment is a product of sexism and racism in our culture, mm-hmm. in areas and in communities and in countries where um, sexism and racism is more prevalent, it then makes sense that so would street harassment be? Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, that data to back that up just doesn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. I know, um, you know, as a runner, a female runner who's out and about all the time, it is, I think, maybe normalized that being harassed and feeling unsafe is, at times are things that you just deal with mm-hmm. when you are out there on the trails, <clears throat> unfortunately. What do you think? Why do you think that is? And why should we be more concerned about this issue in general? Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's absolutely normalized. Um, and it's normalized uh, in a way that's been normalized for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't new. And, you know, I think that um, 
what we're seeing is people um, across the board saying, you know what, like this isn't so normal. This isn't something that, you know, my, my male friends who are running are, are having to put up with, um, or at least not to the same extent that I am. Um, and as people sort of have those click moments, um, then they start to, to want, you know, a different world. They start to want to be able to run and not have to um, worry about mm-hmm. their own safety. And, um, and that's how, you know, Hollaback, uh, started um, is that we all had our own moments of like, wait a minute, you know, if somebody said that to me in the workplace, there would be um, systems in place to address it. Why, when somebody says it on the street, there's nobody there who has my back. There's no system in place to to take it seriously or to address it. It's just me, and I and it's considered the price I pay for, you know, having to walk down the street, run down the street, go mm-hmm. to work, go to school, all of the above. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I mean, if we were to confront somebody that hollered at us, they would be like, oh, you know, it's just innocent, but how are we supposed to know the difference between somebody that is and that could be a predator and somebody that's just trying to think they're cute and little do they know they've, you know, distracted my zen during my run. Or just even being innocent, like, just from that, I feel unsafe, right? Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think that the line is different for everyone. And there's ways that you can say, hey, beautiful to people that some people are like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, There are also ways that you can say, you know, people who hear, hey, beautiful and think, you know what, like, I'm on my run. I'm not here to be your, like, you know, piece of meat on the sidewalk (laughs) um, that's, like, open for comments. Um, you know, and, and two, that's impacted by, you know, your own, uh, your, your person, right? What, how do you like to receive compliments? Do you like to see, receive compliments from strangers? Um, you know, is it even said as a compliment or is the intention to freak you out, to mm-hmm. make you concerned? Um, and I think that for so many people, you know, especially women, we've heard so much harassment throughout our entire lives that when I hear, hey, beautiful, for example, even though that may seem really benign to a lot of folks, I think to myself, okay, what's next, right? Yeah. Like, it's never just that. Yeah. And if I respond to that and I say something like, thank you, are you going to see that as an invitation to um, to stalk me? Mm-hmm. Are you going to see that as an invitation to grope me, to take this further? Is it then going to be my fault if you do, you know, do something more violent in my direction? Um, and so, you know, hey, beautiful, then becomes loaded up by, you know, the 847 other comments that I heard about my body before you said, hey, mm-hmm. beautiful to me this mm-hmm. morning. Yeah, it's a really good point. Exactly. So what do you suggest we could do to protect ourselves and help to protect our community, especially with now a little girl that's out there wanting to walk to school or, you know, eventually be able to go out on her own run? Yeah. 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 And the the thing about this issue is it does really disproportionately impact um, young folks. We've received stories on our site from girls as young as seven. Um, you know, the majority of young women will have experienced this by the time they're age 12. Um, and, um, and young folks are really vulnerable um, because they feel like they can't tell anybody or, you know, if they tell their parents, their parents will never let them outside again by themselves. Um, You know, and they feel a sense of shame about it. Like Mm -hmm. maybe this is my fault. Maybe I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so I think it is, you know, important to highlight um, the impact on, on young folks, et cetera. Um, So, uh, so what do you do? Right. So if you're the person who's being harassed, um, you know, first of all, I think the important thing to remember is it's not your responsibility to have the perfect response um, to harassment. And also that there really is no perfect response to harassment. If we had the perfect response to harassment to shut the harassers down, um, that would have happened a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, what we recommend is, you know, is folks like, you know, gauge their own safety. And if they feel safe, you know, directly um no, you know, hesitations, no, like looking down at the ground, just directly look at them and say, you know what, that's not okay. That's not appropriate. And then keep it moving. Um, what you don't want to do is engage in a back and forth. You're not, you know, looking to be a one woman uh, street harassment education machine. Um, <laughs> what we found is that oftentimes when people are in a place where they're um, actively harassing, it's not the, necessarily the best moment um, for uh, for them to, you know, 
think twice about their behavior. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, However, you know, what we also know is that for you, uh, you know, responding to harassment has a really positive impact on your own well-being. And that can be a response in the moment, but that can also be a longer term response, right? It can be something like sharing your story through our app or on iHolloback.org or talking to a friend. Um, It could be, you know, telling other people and, and, uh, you know, about um, what street harassment is and why it isn't okay and why we shouldn't be putting up with it like you guys are doing on this podcast. So there's lots of different ways um, to fight back um, beyond in the moment. So don't pull a Miranda Um, like on Sex in the City and finally have enough and start yelling the same things back to them? <laughs> I don't Is that what you said? I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I kind of love that moment, though, too, though, because because this is the thing, right? Is Yes, that is not what I'm going to recommend to you because it could escalate and become dangerous. Mm-hmm. However, back to point A, there's no, you know, right or wrong way to do this because ultimately it's their responsibility to stop and not your responsibility to have a perfect response. Right. You know, I have no judgment for a Miranda-like response where you just <laughs> lose it, mm-hmm. right? And tell and tell folks off. No judgment for that. My only concern is I just want to make sure that you're safe. Sure. Yeah. I told a story to Becca just before we called that um, I say I'm a hollabacker. <laughs> and uh, on our honeymoon, my husband and I were riding bikes through town in another country, and they tended to, like, whistle and yell and say something to me, and I would, I would yell back at him, like, it's inappropriate and unwanted and stop. And my husband was so embarrassed, but I'm like, they, they can't do that. <laughs> they need to husband. know. So I tend to be a hollabacker when I feel safe enough to do that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm on the flip side going, really? It's like early in the morning. I haven't brushed my teeth. I'm covered in sweat. I know what I stink. You and you're hollering at me. Yeah. <laughs> like, Ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So we've heard little yeah, bits. It's those moments where you're like, maybe this isn't actually about me. It's like, yeah, maybe this right? is about a bigger, more messed up world that we live in. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, so we've heard little bits, but can you tell us a little bit more about the Hollaback organization, what you stand for, and what you have on the horizon? Yeah, so we are um, all about ending harassment, you know, in, in all of its forms. We started off focusing on street harassment. Uh, we've expanded looking at online harassment. We're also looking at workplace harassment. Um, and look, all of this stuff really comes from those same you know, root causes of the fact that we're still living in a world and a culture that's pretty sexist and pretty racist. And Mm -hmm. in this moment um, in our history, we're seeing a lot of um, harassing behavior, frankly, um, coming from, you know, folks in power. Um, And then we see it sort of okayed, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's happening so um, uh, on the sort of, uh, upper echelons, right. The, the folks who are, you know, leading our country or, you know, uh, the folks who are applying, you know, applying to be on our Supreme court, I guess applying might not be the right word there, but you know, right. uh, being pushed to be on our Supreme yeah, court, right. Exactly. Are doing, are doing this stuff. And so everybody else is like, okay, well maybe I can do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe Especially I can like be a harasser and kids still run for president. Up, right? And mm-hmm. this is really tiny because yeah. on, um, my Apple News, it pops up that this has been a quarter century um, that Anita Hill went on the Supreme Court and was one of the first ones to address sexual misconduct. Oh, so, wow. That's today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, um, the stuff just keeps happening. I mean, even there were efforts to address street harassment way back from the 1920s, and they called themselves the anti-flirt club, um, <laughs> which I find, uh, like, to be hands down the worst name ever. <laughs> flirting <laughs> is like, yay, flirting's awesome, right? But they, you know, were obviously using it in a different yeah, context. Right. They didn't have the, the language of right. sexual harassment yet. That didn't really come around until the 70s and 80s and, and came heavily into the public eye around the time of Anita Hill, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so they didn't have that language, right? They were just like, do not talk to me, stranger. <laughs> right. Right. Um, 
And, uh, and, and yeah, and so, you know, we've seen this issue time and time again emerge and reemerge. And in this moment, too, we're seeing tremendous resistance. At the same time, we're seeing it okayed at the top level of our government. We're also seeing this awesome, you know, Me Too movement and folks coming forward and saying, actually, no, not okay, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so it's just, you know, it's a, I think it's an incredible moment in our history to be doing, doing this work. And, you know, it's an incredible moment to, um, you know, to, to be a woman because there's hope right. that maybe this won't be our forever situation. Um, and at Hollaback, you know, our, our goal is to change the culture that makes this kind of stuff okay. So a lot of what we do um, is, you know, around uh, bringing awareness to this issue, but also around showing everyday folks what they can do um, to respond when they see harassment happen. So mm-hmm. broadly, you know, we call that bystander intervention. What yeah. can you do when you see it happening? Um, and a lot of people think that, you know, the only thing they can do is strap on, you know, a, a superhero cape and swoop down and beat everybody up. (laughs) And that's not what we recommend. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, we have a whole set of, uh, we call it the five D's of bystander intervention, but um, only one of them is directly, you know, telling the person that that's not okay and to stop it. Mm -hmm. The other four are all things that you can do um, that are not direct because, you know, for me, like I'm scared to intervene because I'm scared that then I'm going to be the target, particularly Mm -hmm. because a lot of the intervention what I'm doing is, you know, harassment that's sexist in nature and I'm a woman, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, the, you know, it's things like creating a distraction, like, you know, engaging the person being harassed in a conversation, but, and sort of, uh, just ignoring the harasser mm-hmm. or, you know, dropping your coffee cup or a handful of change to create a commotion. So everyone's attention go, goes away mm-hmm. from that moment. Um, and it kind of breaks it up. Um, so the person can get away if they need to, or, you know, things like finding somebody else who can help things out, or if the harassment's really quick, right. Going up to the person after it happens and saying, you know, are you okay? What can I, what can I do? Cause a lot of harassment's passing and then it's over. Um, or, you know, documenting the harassment, if it's something that's, that's ongoing and making sure that you, um, then give that documentation to the person who was, um, Harass so that they have control over how it's used. You don't want to document harassment and then, you know, put it all over the the nightly the nightly news without that person's mm-hmm. uh, consent because that's going to make them feel even more out of control of the situation. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can show up for folks that don't involve superhero spandex and that don't involve, um, you know, being direct and super confrontational and putting yourself at risk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great Those source. are like great resources. We'll uh, probably post quite a bit of that stuff on our social media so um, people know where right. to find you and um, that helpful information. So, Emily, thanks so much for, for all of that. We like to end every interview with asking our guests how they live out the fit philosophy, um, being so busy on working uh, with an important cause. So how do you balance your own performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self? That was a great question. Just this morning, I was like, should I go for a run or should I go to work early? <laughs> so my <laughs> oh, options are going one. to work early, which is not the answer. <laughs> Always go for a run. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes self-care can be going to work early to, oh, like, yeah. knock things off your list and get ahead of the game, you know? Mm-hmm. Um uh, yeah, no, I, um, it, it is, it is definitely a tricky balance. I have two kids and, um, I, and one of them is almost three and the other one's four months old. So I'm like oh, in this so moment of you're not re-figuring, <laughs> figuring this out, uh-huh. um, yet again. Um, <laughs> and, um, I don't know. I don't have any magic answers other than, um, than just like, I just keep asking the question and I keep trying. And mm-hmm. I keep failing, and mm-hmm. then I ask the question again, and I try all over again. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, um, I don't pretend to be um, winning at, at this, um, but I am, um, I am doing Couch to Five K again. Are you? <laughs> so that's real. <laughs> Yet again. <laughs> Yet again. <laughs> well, those are the answers you started that we love. failing and getting back on again. <laughs> the completely honest answers that nobody really has it all together. So we appreciate that. You're right. Yeah. Well, Emily, thanks so much well, for thank being you on. So much. Yeah, have a great day and um we appreciate the information. Yeah, absolutely. Take okay. care. Yep. Bye, Bye Emily. Emily. Bye Queens. Bye-bye. 
Thank you to our sponsor today, Sentimano Counseling. Sentimano Counseling is the premier perinatal mental health practice in Kansas City, treating mood disorders during pregnancy and postpartum, perinatal loss, infertility, eating, and exercise disorders. Go to Sentimano.com for further information about the practice and services. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fit for a Queen. And Hashtag Fit for a Queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, queens.